What you laughing at? You don't know what's going on. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. You know, I've enjoyed the, I've enjoyed Anita Bryant and these people. You know, the one thing I, I know about, they're not phonies, amen. amen. I've held two meetings in their church, and they must have been satisfied because they never asked me anymore. But anyway... <laughs> But they're a member, they're a member of a real, fundamental, Bible-believing church. And their pastor is a real, fundamental, Bible-believing preacher, a very godly man. And I enjoyed preaching there, and I know this, they're at the services. They're at the services, and they sit there and say amen for you and help you. And I admire the work that they're doing now. And I'm, I admire anything with courage, anything with grit. I was born and reared in the heart of the Hatfield and McCoy feud country. I was baptized by a nephew of Devil Ants Hatfield. And when a fellow got shot in my country, the coroner's verdict was he died of natural causes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I ever got low down enough to fight bulldogs and game chickens. But I always admired anything with grit. There's nothing that ever walked dirt, wore hair, breathed wind that had a more genuine sand than a bulldog or a game chicken until you put steel spurs on the other rooster. And when he felt that steel, he beat it. You know, I go into preaching a lot of places now and a lot of old feather-legged Shanghais fly up on the front roost, you know. And they get all set for us, and I go along pretty good till I start putting the gospel steel to them. And then you'll see them beating it for the brush. But anyway, I've always been for the underdog. If ever you find two dogs in a fight and you can't find me, scratch under the bottom dog. That's where I'll be. <laughs> he told you I'd been preaching for 56 years. I, that's right. Come right down in front when you go to take a picture because I don't like for anything to get up behind me. That's what got Mr. Lincoln. Let me show you. <laughs> I've been preaching 56 years. You know, I started riding a mule with a pair of saddlebags under me. I, someone said, when are you going to retire? Never. I left home the 27th day of February. I've been gone three and uh, ten and a half weeks. I'll get home tomorrow, perhaps. I'm going to fly home tomorrow. You say, what does your wife say? Well, she doesn't say anything about it. She stays there and keeps things going while I preach. The lady said to me, if I was your wife and you was gone three months, I'd sue you for divorce. I said, if you were my wife, I'd want you to. <laughs> I call her every day, every day. I call her every day, most of the time, twice a day, long distance. Somebody said, is that expensive? I said, not as expensive as alimony. <laughs> I... But I'm now booked up for a year and a half or almost two years. And I don't know how long I'm going to be preaching. Someone said, Dr. Lincoln, do you think you're going to die? No, I don't think so. I think the Lord's going to come. Amen. I think the Lord's going to come. But I'm not sitting around waiting for him. Somebody said, the Lord's coming soon. I don't know. He may come soon. He may not. I'm planning my work like I was going to live 50 years. But I'm living like this was the last day I'd ever have on earth. I started out believing the Bible is the Word of God. And I still believe that. And I've never deviated from that. I've gone straight down the line preaching man's a sinner, Christ's a savior. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shame uh, and a hell to shun. Life is short, death is certain, eternity is long. And so that's the way I preach to people. I want to talk to you a little while now. I'm going to talk to you a little while about why Jesus came to this earth. Why Jesus came to this earth. And I'm going to talk, first of all, about Jesus. If he is not and was not what I claim he is and was in the first part of this message, then he can't do what I claim he, did, he came to do in the last part of it. And so the first part of it, we're going to begin. 
with Matthew chapter 22 and verse 42. But what think ye of Christ, whose son is he? What think ye of Christ, whose son is he? Now many people may think it makes no difference concerning the parentage of Christ, whether he was the son of God or the son of Joseph. But to my mind, it does make a difference. But to my mind, it does make a difference. A little girl asked me one day, what do you do with the begets of the Bible? Like this one begot that one and this one begat that one. I said, I read them. What do you do? She said, I skip them. Well, then if you skip them, you miss something. Remember that Matthew gave the genealogy of Jesus because he presented him as a king. Mark did not give him a genealogy because Mark presented him as a servant. And a servant does not have a genealogy. So when Matthew wrote about him, he said this, And Matthan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. If you'll notice, the begetting stopped with Joseph. He didn't say that Joseph begat Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was not begotten by natural parentage. He, was not, he did not come by natural generation. Somebody said, what difference does it make? It makes this difference. They said, it's all, the, different, the main thing is he was a good man. No, if he was not God, he was not good. If he was not the God man, he was not the good man. Why? Because he was a liar and a deceiver. And so to be that, he was not good. He was not good. And then too, I think if the attack upon the miracle of the virgin birth, or if the attack upon the miracle of our Lord goes unchallenged, they will next attack the miracle of his resurrection. And then they will attack everything that's supernatural about him, and they'll end their attack upon the cross. And we will be without a Christ altogether. We will be without a Christ altogether. Now, if Jesus was not conceived by the Holy Ghost and born to the Virgin Mary as the Bible says he was, and I believe that he was born, as the Bible says, of a virgin, not as the RSV says, of a good woman. No, he, she, could have been a, she, could have, she could have been that and not been a virgin. She could have been a virgin and not been a young woman. But he said he shall be born of a virgin, and I believe that. Now, I believe that the Bible, the Bible says he was. And if he was not as the Bible says he was, then Mary, the mother of Jesus, was not a good woman because she was found great with child before they came together. Then if Mary was great with child through Joseph, why did she say to Joseph, how, can, how she say to the angel, how can this thing be, seeing that I know not a man? That's when the angel said, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee and the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Then, if Mary was great with child through Joseph, why did Joseph seek to put her away? You said, that's natural, not when you know Joseph. Because the Bible says that Joseph was a just man. And Joseph sought to put her away privately, which he had a right to do for fornication. Because if Joseph found that she had been unfaithful during the time of engagement and consummation of the marriage bond, then he had a right to put her away. Then if Mary was great with child through Joseph, why did God have to send an angel to explain the matter to Joseph? And after the explanation of the angel, by the angel to Joseph, Joseph received her back. Then if Mary was great with child through Joseph, then, my friend, why did the angel say, The power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and that which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, they call this something new. This isn't new at all. This new, this new stuff that we have today, this liberalism, this modernism is not new. It's as old as Eden. It's as old as the Garden of Eden. Why? Back in the Garden of Eden, you remember? When the, first, when the angel came and said, uh, when, the, uh, when the angel came, and said to, or the devil came and said to Eve, Hath God spoken? 
Hath God spoken? You see what he sought to do? He sought to get her to call in question that there ever been a revelation. And she said, yes, God hath spoken. Then the second thing he sought to do was to get her to call in question the truthfulness of that revelation. He said, what God said to you is not so. The day that you eat of this, you shall not die, but you shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. He said, now you know only the good, but then you'll know both good and evil. In hell they know only the bad. In heaven they know only the good. On earth, midway between the two, they have a mixture of both good and evil. So he tempted Eve and Eve ate, and gave unto Adam and he ate, and thus brought the downfall of the world, that brought the downfall of the race. Remember, my friend, it was the woman in the transgression. It was the woman in the transgression. I'm going to lead you to something that perhaps you haven't seen and don't get excited now. This is not going to fit very well with some people. A lady said to me the other day, Dr. Lakin, you're all the time talking about the men, the women. said, where would the men be if it weren't for the women? I said, back in Eden, they're sitting around under the trees, having a good time. That's exactly where. Let me show you why. Why? Because he said it was the woman in the transgression. Did you ever notice what was lost in the fall? The curse upon the earth, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. The curse upon the man, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. The curse upon the serpent, upon thy belly shalt thou go. And the curse upon the woman, in childbearing thy sorrow shall be multiplied, and thy husband shall rule over thee. Don't you fellows say amen, I'm trying to help you out, let me tell you something. God took a, now listen to me, don't get excited, this will not help some of the good ladies today. Their philosophy of life, the devil took a woman. Listen, God said, Mr. Devil, you took a woman without a man in it. You took a woman without a man in it. And you brought the downfall of the race. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to take a woman without a man in it, and I'll redeem the race. How? For a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child of the Holy Ghost without a man in it. Without a man in it. He said, Mr. Devil, I know what you'll do. You'll hang him upon a cross. That is, you'll bruise his heel. But while you're bruising his heel, he'll get your head. While you're bruising his heel, he'll get your head. And there, my friend, is where the, there's where the conflict of the ages began between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, between Christ and Antichrist. And he said, there's where the thing will happen. Oh, God, pity the man who with the word of God open before him lends himself to the sacrilegious but futile attempt to, to snatch from the blessed brow of Jesus that masterpiece of incontrovertible Godhood. God, pity him. I thank God he came into the world. I thank God the way he came. He could, I thank God for the way he did come. He could not have come a more better way. One of the relatives came home from college one said, and said the professor said, the professor said that Jesus couldn't have been born of a human mother without a human father, that that was a biological impossibility. I said, well, ring a ding ling. I said, let me tell you something. It's a biological impossibility. I said, you think so? I said, you tell the little professor that I said that the first man that ever got in this world got here without either father or mother. Crack that nose, Marty. And if, <laughs> and if the first... They can poke that down the neck of kids. Bring them around let the old man have them a while. Let me show you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. He said the first man, oh, but she said the first man came by the way of evolution. Then I said the first germ got here without father or mother. Life has never been generated from dead matter. But she said the first germ came from another planet on a meteor. I said, is that so? I said, listen. Don't you know that a meter is a blazing ball of fire? I said, how would a germ ever live in that? I said, you better get in the house. Automobile run over you and kill you. Let me show you something. <laughs> she said, but that's the scientific way that we came into the world. That's the most unscientific thing I've ever heard in my life. Amen? 
that are way back yonder sometime, somewhere, somehow, nobody knows when, how, where, or why, nothing got in, nothing, the nothing formed to something. The something became a germ, got in the water, developed it into a tadpole, and the tadpole swam to another bank one day and got stuck in the mud and dried there, and wriggling around in the mud, he formed warts on his belly, and later they became legs, and after developed legs, he became a land animal, and climbing through the trees one day, his foot slipped, and as it fell, he wrapped his tail around the limb of the jaw, but broke off his tail, he hit the ground, stood up on his hind feet, walked across the street, bought him a suit of clothes, went to teaching in the university and said, thank God, I'm a man at last. <laughs> now, if you don't have to stullify your brain to believe that, amen. <laughs> it's like a little fella came up to me with a pair of pants on so tight he'd have to grease his feet to get them on sort of an Australian sheepdog haircut and peeling his upper lip for the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And he said, you don't believe in evolution, do you? I said, I didn't. <laughs> but now I'm not dead sure about it. Oh, beloved, for th you know something? For 56 years, I've hung all of my sermons around the cross and strung all my pearls upon the cord of the atonement. And I've never had to, I've never had to back up or apologize for it. Amen. One of these days when I'm in the battle and the captain of my salvation tapped me on the shoulder and said, Old soldier, it's time for you to come home. And I go yonder and hang my sword on the shimmering wall of the city of God. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've, you've been faithful. And I say, yes, sir. I ne yes, Lord. I never doubted one bit of your word. I've never trimmed my sails. I've stood and told them that Jesus was the Son of God and that he could save from all sin. That's what I'll tell them, my friend. That's the only hope of the thing. Listen, they said it's utterly impossible it's not impossible what's impossible when you make god positionally place god positionally where god belongs and you won't have any trouble that is in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and put god in the beginning and all the miracles will become easy right. a fellow came up to me and said you believe the miracles of the Bible. Yes, sir. You, you believe all, you, you, do, you believe everything in the Bible. I do. He said, where did Cain get his wife? I said, that's your trouble now. You're interested in somebody else's wife. That's your trouble now. <laughs> I thank God I lived in the days of the giants. We li I lived in the days of the giants when preachers believe something and preach something. That's the reason you ought to support and stand by a work like this. He asked for five hundred dollars for the brick. Yes, Mrs. Lincoln and I went sent the other day. The other day, as a memorial to our boy that we lost when he was thirty-one. Let me tell you something. Stand by. We're too. It's too. We're far too lax in holding up the hands of men who stand for the truth and hold up the truth. Amen. These good people that's putting on this crusade for your children. They're putting on this crusade for your children. It's for yours. Amen. Don't you ever think that the opposition and the enemy, don't you think that they aren't well financed? And yet God's people have to go along to beg for a few pennies to stand in the breach to hold the thing straight today. You do what Dr. Falwell asked you to do. I believe you will see that God moves. You say, but Brother Lincoln, the virgin birth of the Lord is so unnecessary. Well, now that takes a lot of gall for a little finite mind like me to tell an omnipotent God what's necessary and what isn't necessary. Let me tell you, I believe it was necessary. Because if Jesus was to be your Savior and mine, he had to be sinless himself. He could never have borne away the sins of others if he had been a sinner. But having no sin to account for for himself, he could take my sin. He could be my sin bearer. And my sin was placed upon him and he carried it away, my friends, and paid for it upon the cross. Oh, a fellow said to me, 
He said, do you believe that the blood of one man could atone for the sin of the whole world? I said, my dear man, it was not a business transaction. It was, a, it, was, it was not a business transaction. It was a moral satisfaction. But had it been a business transaction, I believe that the deity of Christ lent a costliness to his blood that would have made it atone for the sin of the whole world. Therefore, if he was to be sinless, if he had to be sinless himself, I could think of nothing that precluded the possibility of a moral taint in the life of Jesus from the earliest moment of conception, like the supernatural virgin birth. Amen. I thank God that he did come, and I thank God he came the way he did. And he becomes my Savior and your Savior. Therefore, my friends, therefore, my friends, he is able to do what I'm saying now that he came to do what... He said he came to take away, he came to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil is lying and lust and everything that's born in hell and spewed out of perdition. He came to destroy the work. There's only one thing in this world I'm afraid of, and that's sin. There's only one thing can harm me or hurt me, and that's sin. No man ever trifled with it that sin didn't get the better of him. Sin didn't get the better of him. And if you'd have your sin taken there, he never bound you so tightly or forged a chain in the hottest hell with his own hand, Satan. But what Jesus with a nail-scarred hand cannot break the chain and set you free. I broke God's law. He came between. I'm depending on him to save. And I've been saved by his grace and kept by it too. The lady said, Brother Lincoln, I hope to see you in heaven. I said, it's up to you because I'm going. Amen. Bow your head a moment for prayer.